Okay, so just to review the top-down approach that we're working with here, and this is a very traditional approach to fundamental analysis, stock analysis. And the first step, which we talked about uh, in the previous chapter, is economic analysis. We need to know where we stand in the economy, and specifically how the economic, um, the present-day economics and the likelihood of the, the next 12 months of, of economic activity will affect our stock and our industry. And step two is the industry analysis. And this is where we pick, we look through all the various industries and we try to look at the industries that will most likely take advantage of the current economic conditions. The industries that are most likely to be prosperous and return high stock prices to us over the next 12 to 24 months. So you want to look over this, the different industries, understand their uh, situation and the level of competition among the, um, the industries for whatever customers are out there. Within the industry, on step three is when we start to go within the industry. So step three, we go into actually looking at company-specific information and company-specific data. So here is where we actually look at all the individual stocks in the industry and try to pick out the one or two or three stocks that are going to perhaps do the best altogether. So the idea is if you, okay, I've selected what I think is the best industry, and now I found the two or three companies in that industry that are going to do the, do the best of the best of the industry, giving you uh, a superior return compared to just picking any stock in the industry or, or picking all the stocks in the industry. So can you imagine if you found the best three or four industries you could, that are going to move forward in the next 12 months, and then out of those three or four industries, you find nine or so of the, or 10 or so of the best stocks out of maybe 40, 50 stocks. So if you do that level of analysis, your return should be better than just owning the industry in total. Okay, so there is this concept of a efficient market that we will be going over in a later chapter, all the efficiencies of market hypothesis and things like that. But the, the, the basic bottom line point is that with all these individual people making buys and sells in stock, they create sort of like an artificial intelligence of, of input. So all this supply and demand buying and selling of stocks are supposed to lead stocks to be priced correctly at any time. So whenever you look at a stock price, it's said that the price should be efficient because we have hundreds if not thousands if not possibly millions of shares being traded by many investors who are basically buying the stock when they think it's too low, selling the stock when they think it's too high of a price, giving the any day, any day price the stock is at, it's supposed to be efficiently valued. So it's the correct price at that day and time. So why would you need to do any fundamental analysis if stocks are always correctly priced according to the efficient market hypothesis? But it's still important because, many of us feel it's still important because for, some, for certain reasons the market's not always efficient. Um, now, the more people who have skills in fundamental analysis, have good skills in fundamental analysis, and can make good valuation calls, the more efficient the market is going to get. So the market does have some efficiency built in because there's a good vast amount of people who have the fundamental analysis skills and look at stocks and can judge their intrinsic value uh, pretty closely. But financial markets are not perfectly efficient because we have many factors that can create pricing errors. And we have many... Um, points of view that may conflict. So people may look at, say, Apple today and, and say, well, there are new products coming out I'm not enthusiastic about, and I don't think Apple is going to be as strong as a company in the future as it is today because the other companies are catching up with their products, like the Galaxy and the Surface tablets are closing the gap of innovation, and uh, Apple isn't as far out ahead as they were in the past, so therefore I'm using that as a reason where I price a stock lower than some of my valuation models are saying the stock should be at this price, but I'm actually intuitively feeling that the company's not going to be as strong in the future without the leadership of Steve Jobs, so I'm actually going to discount on that basis. That's one person's opinion. Another person's opinion would be, actually the company is doing fine, they're going to be more innovative and have more freedom to move forward, and they have plans to move into new markets that should actually double the company in five years. So those are two conflicting points of view, which are going to have a conflicting effect on the stock price. So the point is, not every fundamental analysis knows everything. And every once in a while, a group of them may be thinking the wrong way. And the actual truth of what's going to happen uh, uh, might be something that you figure out 
quicker or early on or get more of a hint of it based on certain uh, financial metrics and understanding of the company. A lot of times some analysts will focus heavily on the inventory uh, and see what's selling or, or, or what, what are they making a lot of that isn't moving. So there's, there's a lot of different nuances you can get into to really try to get an idea, put you ahead of the other analysts who may not be looking at everything that you're looking at. So there are inefficiencies. The market has proven that it's not completely efficient. There are inefficiencies, but there also are brilliant people who after they review the fundamental facts of a company have more of an intuition about where the company's going based on subtle clues that other analysts might miss. And that's, that can only be accomplished through years of experience. So generally by rule when you're starting out as a fundamental analysis uh, analyst, you're not that good because you don't have the experience. You have all the know-how, all the college education, you know all the, all the variables, you know all the financial ratios, how they relate to each other, you know how to construct financial statements, but you don't have the experience or intuition that really can move you uh, forward in your analysis. And that's why there's inefficiencies because we have all bunch of, so many fundamental analysts out there at different levels of experience and the more inexperienced analysts do, usually uh, are making mistakes and putting the wrong intrinsic value or paying too much or maybe too little for stocks and that can always obscure the true picture of what the price of the stock should be. So in investing it's, def it's definitely the more experienced analysts and investors have an advantage over the less experienced because their intuition has been built up through time of all this analysis they're doing and just through the repetitiveness of the cycles of companies that leads to the inefficiencies of stock prices which makes financial analysis and fundamental analysis you know, a worthwhile exercise. So let's just review quickly again. The economic analysis, to move back a few steps, we want to get to know the general state of the economy and how that can be used in valuating stocks. So if the economy is going to be booming and, the, and economic forecasts are saying 2, 3, 4, 5 percent growth for the world, we have to factor that into stock prices because that's going to translate into better people feeling more confident in buying more stocks, pushing prices higher. Now, so the state of economy we know has a direct influence on stock prices. Um, and we have to look at this at both a global and a domestic basis because we're, we're such a globalized economy we need to factor in both, both of those um, data points. So the b behavior of the economy is captured over time in a business cycle and the business cycle is going to reflect um, the ups and downs of economic activity and those ups and downs directly correlate to stock price movements as well and stock price typically will be a, a leading indicator moving before the cycle. All right, and again, as I said before, we need to use this economic data to figure out which industries will benefit because different industries benefit at different points of the economic cycle. And then we could use that to evaluate individual companies and their sales and profits and how they're going to be affected by not just the, you know, remember economics is also closely tied to demographics. And in demographics, we have an aging world population, so one industry that should benefit is healthcare. And healthcare is a little, uh, defensive, so it's going to do well in an in a expanding or contracting economy. So we would expect sales and profits to continually increase for health care companies as an aging population needs more health care. And as also as the um, Obamacare expands health care to many more individuals in this country and as the growing income levels of people in India and China give them more access to drugs and medications and medical doctors. So that's just one way, not just using economics but also tying in current demographic changes. The, um, the important point to remember is that the stock prices change before the actual economy changes. So they're a leading indicator. Um, so that can actually help you predict the, the business cycle. So right now, since stocks haven't gone down, I am not predicting a recession. Stocks are continuing to go up and do well, so I am not predicting, stocks are not predicting any recession in the next six months. So, that's, so that would mean that 
Uh, I could now go to industry level saying, I want to look at the industries that do well in the expanding economy over the next six months. So we would evaluate the competitive positions of different industries uh, related to other industries and look for opportunities and growth potentials. Maybe some new industries like cloud computing is a new, um, uh, computers would be the sector, but the industry uh, could be, or sub-industry even, because it's so small, cloud computing. Different companies who are making sor storage or offering space in cloud computing and storage. Mostly, mostly right now the cloud is storage, but in a, in a certain point it will also be computing where your processor won't be on your, your motherboard in your house, but it'll be up in the cloud. So you just need really a really light, small terminal, and then you're in a good internet connection and you can access your processing power in the cloud. So basically your computer will just be in the cloud and you just need a monitor and keyboard and a small processor and internet connection to connect to your computer in the cloud, which means that there's no physical hardware. So if you want, anytime you feel like your computer is getting slow or you don't have enough storage, you just order a bigger cloud drive and order a bigger cloud processor and there you go. Okay. And then even certain programs and TV shows won't have to be... Um, uh, can be just shifted over to your computer in the cloud and then downloaded directly to your terminal. So those are things that are most likely going to happen in the future, which is going to make the, the computer terminal very inexpensive because it's not going to have to have all the heavy computing components and graphic cards and processors and, and all that memory. It could be a lot lighter machine, so the tablets and, and uh, laptops are going to be a lot, could be probably priced at $100 to give you as long as you could get the bandwidth that's the important point. This doesn't work unless you have the bandwidth uh, and the internet access to reach the cloud computer. But right now we're starting with cloud storage. So this was what I, something I see as a growing industry. So I want to look for the companies that are going to be a player in that industry. Um, so that'd be something that would look promising. And then step three is a fundamental analysis. So I would want to, if I found several companies that fit that description of that sub-industry, I'm going to want to look into them and say, okay, which companies have the financial ability to establish themselves and wait for growth, because it's sort of a, a beginning stage of growth in that industry, that's going to um, give me the best chance of increasing my income, my capital gains. So we want to evaluate the financial conditioning and operating results of a specific company. So we look at every specific company in the industry and we want to evaluate which companies are the best to buy. So we want to know what's their competitive position. Are they like McDonald's number one in the industry or are they somewhat uh, a lesser position in the industry? Sometimes being number one isn't always the best because you could be number one but they may limit your growth potential because you already have, if you're McDonald's, you already have McDonald's everywhere. So there's not much growth potential. But if you're Shake Shack, you have the potential to open another 2,000 restaurants which is going to completely um, change the whole landscape of their financial returns. Same thing uh, for Chipotle Mexican Grill. They still have the up, they haven't opened that many restaurants yet, and they still have the ability to open many, many more. Uh, so you want to look at their growth in sales and that potential in that area as well. Profit margins and the dynamics of earnings, and we'll see that we definitely have to look at gross operational and net profit margins and see how. The, those companies perform in those areas. And we definitely want to buy companies that perform stronger in the operational and net income areas. Their asset mix, the cash balance, inventory, accounts receivable, fixed assets, we want to know how um, efficient their assets are. You know, you would want, if you looked at a company that decided they had an eight hour factory, that factory that ran for eight hours, and they needed to you know, double their output, so they built a whole other factory to run for eight more hours across town. And that's how they used to do things. And so someone figured out, well, why don't we just make people work at night and overnight? So instead of building three fa two additional factories to, to triple my output, I could just take my one eight-hour factory and put a second shift on and a third shift on. So I could run 24 hours a day. And, high, and that means my capacity, my asset utilization and capacity are going to be maxed out. So I'm getting more return from those assets rather than buying a whole other set of assets that you don't need. You know, it's sort of like you're renting an apartment and you're running out of space, so you, just, so you decide to buy another apartment just to put things into, just to have more space or an extra bedroom. You know, it's sort of a waste of money, a waste of space, because you're going to buy a whole apartment just to do, use 25% of it. 
might be more efficient just to buy a storage unit. So a lot of things you do in your personal life, of course you would do that, it makes sense, but sometimes companies need to think in that ma method and you need to evaluate them to see are they using their assets as efficiently as possible. That's the way McDonald's a long time ago, they were just a lunch place and then they expanded to say let's have breakfast and that's what Taco Bell is doing right now, they're trying to establish a breakfast. A few years ago Wendy's tried this and failed. So, but the idea is if I can keep my, op my restaurant open and operating for longer periods of da time, I can, you know, make more money. So a 24-hour restaurant that is busy for 24 hours is a lot more profitable than some restaurants that are only open for lunch and breakfast. You know, and those assets are just sitting idle the rest of the day, making no money. So of course the value of the stock is influenced by the financial performance um, of the company and, and the stock that's this issued. So where do you start? Interpreting the financial statements is sort of the first part. Now interpreting raw financial statements is very difficult because you can't compare them easily to other financial statements. So we use financial ratios as a way to, com to compare companies to each other. So if you have different sized companies, you have to have percentiles or comparable measures so you could judge who's in the better position. So size will become less of a factor. Um, and it's, a, it's demanding and it's a time consuming um, phase of stock selection doing the fundamental analysis. And for your, analysis, your analyst reports, you are going to want to take some time um, looking over your, your, your database of information to, to get an idea of, I don't expect you to go into depth in every company, but you certainly could get a cursory look and say, okay, these companies look like they're doing the best just by checking PE levels, profit margins, a couple key indicators um, to get an idea because we're gonna really, you're going to really have to go into more depth fundamentally of each ratio once you pick your company. So we don't have time for you to do that for every company industry. So you kind of make your best guess of which two companies look the strongest and then you're going to delve in deeper when you write your report to discuss all, all these results. Okay, let's quickly review the financial statements just to put you in the right frame of mind before I start going into the financial ratios. So the balance sheet is a snapshot of the company's assets, liabilities, and equity at, at a point in time. So just like if I took a picture of your financial life right now today and I would see how much money you have in the bank, what assets you own, so maybe you have $5,000 in the bank, maybe you own a car and a computer, and then I would see um, what liabilities you have. Do you have a loan on that car? Do you have student loans? Do you have credit card loans? So all this gives me a financial snapshot of where you are. So there could be people who look you know, um, very wealthy, or, or there, there are people that you may know that seem like they spend them a lot of money and you assume they must, they must be pretty wealthy because they have a nice car, they always have a nice new computer, nice clothes, they're always treating people when you go out or buying drinks, have a nice jewelry, uh, maybe they have a nice house and you're thinking, wow, this person might be doing very well. And then, so you say, I'm going to marry this person because they're doing so great. But then after you're married, you sit down and you look and say, oh my God, you have $200,000 in credit card bills, you owe more on the house than it's worth. Your car is a lease. Um, your clothes are borrowed from your sister, and you know, and you just find out that they don't really own or have any of these assets. They're just good at leveraging these assets. Uh, so what they really, their net worth is a negative million dollars. So now that's half your net w loss as well. So that's why looks can be deceiving. And it's the same thing with companies. Some companies could look like they're doing really well, but if you look underneath the engine and you see, okay, these are the assets they have, but they have a huge amount of liabilities, that's a very risky company. So that's why you have to always get an idea of how their assets to liabilities mix and then, then you know, the basic formula is assets minus liabilities equals shareholders equity. So if your liabilities are higher than your assets, you actually have negative equity. It means the company has no value, it actually has a loss. Not a technical loss, but it's actually in the hole. Um, so assets are things that the company owns. And just like you know, you can own things without paying for them. But, if, but you would like a company that owns things that have them paid for or mostly paid off. Because that makes them more safe, more um, financially uh, secure. 
Liabilities is whenever the company borrows money. They can borrow money, in the firm, they can borrow money from credit from other uh, companies. That would be accounts payable. They could borrow bo bonds from investors as long-term debt. They, um, they can have all, all sorts of credit cards and different things. Companies can have a lot of liabilities um, in bills and debt and things of that nature. And equity is simply the difference between assets and liabilities. So we're looking at what, how much, uh, after you take away everything we borrowed, what's left. Basically, the way I look at it is, if you were to close the business down today and sell everything that you own and pay off all your liabilities, how much do you have left? Just like you could look at your life, if you were going to you know, sell everything you own and pay off all your debts, how much money would you have sitting in front of you? Uh, and then, the, of course, the more equity you have, the bigger that pile of money will be at the end of that business. So that's why we like to buy or invest in companies that have a lot of equity, because they you know, are more secure company. They actually have tangible um, value. So the, the balance sheets are relative amounts. So um, it's hard to compare one company's balance sheet to another company's balance sheet because they're all rel the amounts are all relative to each other. So you want to look at the percentage of assets to liabilities, the percentage of inventory to current assets. So we use a lot of percentages to get an idea of how we could compare one person's balance sheet to another person's balance sheet. So if it was you know, in a personal situation, you could say, you know, I have a 60% equity stake in my house. So even though we have different size houses, we could, you can kind of see how people measure up and how much of the house they've paid off. It's also important to look at trends. And that's why you know, that one spreadsheet um, that you should have for your analysis is a trend where you have five years of balance sheet accounts and income statement accounts. And then year over year, you could see what percentage of sales growing every year, what percentage of profits growing every year, you know, how, what percentage are profit margins growing every year. So we get this trend. And we want to see that the trend is positive and the company is moving forward and it's well managed and it's growing at, a, at a, a, a relatively progressive pace. Just like if I was to uh, look at your application for the school here and I'm looking at your, um, your history of your courses, I want to see that you started out. I, I don't care so much where you started out. I want to see where you ended up. So if you started out, say, as a B student or a C student as a freshman undergrad, but you ended up as a, in a junior and a senior having A's, I like that progression, that you figured how school works and you progressively did better, and you ended up a lot stronger. And, you know, two people could both have a 3.25 GPA average, but I only may have room for one of them in the program. I'm going to pick the one who has an upward trend in their grades, not a downward trend. I don't like people who start out as A's as a, a freshman and a sophomore, and then B's and C's as a senior and, a, and a, a junior. It just, you're going on a downward trend. And the same thing for companies. So that's why we like these trend analysis to see what direction. And typically, we can have a little bit more confidence that they're going to maintain this forward. Because obviously, the management has a knack of planning and executing uh, a tight growth and profit strategy over the years. This is an example of a balance sheet, which you've all been exposed to in many classes. So this is nothing new, new, and this is not a class where we teach you how to make a balance sheet. But you just know you have your assets, and they're listed in order of the um, most current to the most long term. And the same thing for liabilities, and then also with our equity. And again, the thing about a balance sheet is the assets have to balance the equities and liabilities. So the amount of the assets balance the amount of equities and liabilities. And when I was an accountant for many years, my balance sheets didn't always balance, so I just made up some numbers somewhere to make a balance. And apparently that wasn't a good thing, so that's why now I teach. Uh, now the income statement. And even more, to me, this is the most important financial statement is the income statement. Um, just like, say you're going to marry somebody, the balance sheet could tell you, okay, they, where the debts are and what they own. And, but I'd be more interested in, in not so much of what their debts are and what they own, but I'd be more interested in like, what is your earnings potential? What are you, how much are you making right now? Because if someone had a lot of debt, say someone had $200,000 worth of debt, I don't know if that's a problem because I would really want to know what your, you know, how much money do you make a year? So if you're making $500,000 a year, 
$200,000 in debt is no problem. But if you're making $20,000 a year, $200,000 in debt's a big problem. So that's why the, the income statement is more important because it tells us what revenues your company is generating. So companies who are generating big revenues and big profits, whatever their liabilities are, if they're, the money they're generating in one year is greater than their liabilities for that, for that balance sheet, then that's not a problem at all. So that's why sometimes the balance sheet's an important aspect, but the income statement's much more important. Just like if you were going to, like I was saying before, going to marry somebody and not, and let, let's face it, marriage is a financial contract. It's not really a love contract. It's just really, okay, let's, you know, we like ourselves enough that we can tie ourselves together financially. And it, ideally in this world, you would like to have two strong earners. So you would feel a little bit more confident knowing that someone has a, a decent job and making a decent amount of money. That makes them, uh, in some people's minds, a better catch, as they call it. Although it's easy to swallow that idea when you think of marriage as a financial contract, not a love contract, because the marriage is mostly about um, in the eyes of institutions is more a financial joining than a, um, a love joining. Anybody can be in love and that doesn't need a contract or a ring or a priest, you know, but in order to file your taxes jointly, that needs a ring and a priest and a, and a contract, you know, so that's why I say it's, a, you know, more of a financial commitment. Um, okay, so in the income statement, we have the revenues. The revenues are very important. If you don't have revenues, you don't have profits. So companies must have revenues and expanding revenues. Expenses are important. How much, I mean, I could generate any number of revenues you want me to generate, I can easily generate for any business, any company at any time. But I may have to use a lot of expenses to get to those revenues levels. So if you say, Professor Nugent, can you, can you guarantee me a billion dollars worth of revenues? I say, I can absolutely guarantee you a billion dollars of revenue. I could get that done for you by the end of the year. I have, no, I have full confidence that I could do this for any business, any company, any time I can generate a billion dollars worth of revenue for you. However, the way I'm gonna do that is um, I'm gonna offer somebody uh, $200 for every $100 that they buy from me. So in that way, in a matter of days, I'll generate a billion dollars worth of revenues, but I'm going to have to pay out $2 billion, $2 billion worth of incentives to get those revenues. So my expenses are, my revenues are $1 billion and my expenses are $2 billion. But I still generated those billion dollars of revenues that you wanted, you know. Just think of a store where um, every time you buy something from me, I'm going to give you a, um, what are those, uh, what are those things called when you, after you buy it, you fill it out and they give you money back? A rebate. A rebate. So every time you buy from me, it's every time you buy a car from me for $10,000, I'm going to mail you a $15,000 rebate. You know how fast I'll get to a billion dollars worth of sales if that's my deal? Now, I'm not saying that's a good deal, but I'm saying that revenues can easily be generated depending on the amount of expenses you want to put behind them. So the, the companies that are much more efficient and responsible minimize their expenses while stabilizing or growing their revenues. So you don't want to uh, grow your revenues by cutting your prices uh, too drastically, you know, in a, in a price war with other companies to gain market share, because you're not going to have the third issue here, profits. So you have your revenues minus your expenses equal your profits. And the whole game is about profits. Any company, the job of any company is to maximize shareholders' wealth. That's the reason the company it was created. The company wasn't created to be nice to its employees. The company wasn't created to be nice to its customers. The company was created to maximize the wealth of the individuals putting money into the company. Now, it just so happens to be that if you treat your customers nicely, you generally make more profits. And you're, if you treat your employees decently, they're generally more productive for you. So that's the only reason companies treat their employees nicely or their customers nicely is because it's going to generate more profits for them. I'll give you a case in point. If you ever go on the Long Island Railroad, they don't really care, since they're a monopoly, if you're a customer or not. So you don't get the same level of a customer service on the train because they know they got you. So, and, if, and if they lose you as a customer, they don't care because they're subsidized. So you're, you're on the Long Island Railroad and you have to stand up and I'm saying to the conductor, I, I refuse to pay for a ticket. I'm paying for a ticket to sit on the train. And if you're making me stand, what kind of service is that? I shouldn't have to pay for this. I want a rebate. You know what I'm going to get? Well, if you don't pay me, I'm calling the cops. Oh, okay. I guess I'll pay you then. You know, so 
or you get the you know, conductors that are kind of rude or grumpy and because they don't care. They're not going to lose you as a customer because there's no competition fighting for your business. There's no train in the next set of tracks that you could switch to because the guy was rude to you. And that's why they can treat their customers rudely or maybe, maybe rudely is too strong of a word, maybe indifferently. Like they don't really care. Just, you know, there's no high, it's not like an airline when you have a, you know, airlines treat you a lot nicer because there's a lot of competition. So, so companies aren't made to treat you nicely unless it's profitable for them. Uh, they don't treat their employees nicely unless it's profitable for them. If you're in a certain industry where you don't need to treat your employees nicely, then they're not going to treat them nicely. Because it's all about the profits. Never forget that. Whatever a company does, behind the scenes it's for the profits. And you say, oh no, British Petroleum, they invest in alternative energies and they do charities. And they, yeah, they're not doing that because to be nice. They're doing that so they could use it as a marketing tool to say, hey, we invest in green and solar energies. But then if you look into the financials of it, you find out they advertise a lot more money than the, the, the fact that they invest in green energies than they actually invest in green energies. You know, so companies are doing, if they're doing anything charitable, it's to make them look better so you feel better about the company so you buy more from them. Oh, I could buy British Petroleum gasoline because they invest in alternative energies. It's not destroying the planet. You know, so it's all psychological. So whatever investments or whatever they do, they may seem like uh, they're doing it at the goodness of the heart. No, they're doing that to maximize profits because it happens to be that it's a strategy that will maximize profits. And a lot of people seem to forget that, you know. That's why you have to be on your guard with any company because they're really doing what's in their best interest, not in your best interest. But they're going to advertise that what they do is in your best interest. So you get fooled into thinking, I have loyalty for this company. They do what's in my best interest. No, they've just brainwashed you because brainwashing is a great way to maximize wealth. You know, ask anybody that favors Coke or Pepsi. People say, I like Coke better. I like Pepsi better. You've just been marketed it and branded by one of these companies to think that their product's better. When in all reality, there's much, not much difference between colas. You know, if you, um, there is a difference, and I'm not going to argue taste or whatever. Um, but for me, whatever's on sale that week works just as fine, you know. I used to be brainwashed into thinking that I can only drink Coke, and now I purposely rotate whatever cola I drink so I won't be brainwashed. And if I was really smart, I wouldn't drink it at all. That's the only way to be smart with soda. So what we're looking for in the income statement is the relative amounts, large versus small, which means um, it's nice to get a, an idea of a relationship between sales to assets, sales to profits, assets to profits, assets to equities, you know, liabilities and equities. So we're looking at relative amounts between each other and the relationships. How expenses grow compared to revenues. So if I'm at a certain revenue level, and that, that usually generates 20% of expenses, and suddenly the next 100 million is generating an extra 30% of expenses per dollar, then I'm, I'm, I'm really straining myself to get those extra revenues where I'm not, they're not as profitable as the revenues before. So we want to know, you know, what's this relationship between revenues and expenses? And you could think of it like this. Say, you know, a company needed to expand its production to get higher revenues, so they started paying their, fa their staff overtime to work 10 hours a day so they could make 20% more goods for the week. But those goods are going to come at a higher price because now they have to pay two and a half time, one and a half times salary. So you want to kind of look at you know, how relationships, uh, and it may be a fact that their factory is maxed out so they have to subcontract additional factory space more expensively somewhere else to expand their revenues. So we want to see what's this relationship between expenses and revenues. How much expenses do these revenues generate? And then the trend is the same thing with the year over year spreadsheet I was talking about. We want to see are they improving or decreasing their metrics and profit margins and income um, and sales. And we don't like companies who are having lower and lower sales every year. And we especially hate companies that are, are having lower and lower profit margins. So as an investor, these are companies you sell. You put a sell rating on. So if the company is losing revenue, this is the, one of the things you can easily check in your spreadsheet. If the company is losing revenues or the profit margins are going lower, then that's probably not a buy company. You know, a buy company is companies that have 
their revenue is increasing, but more importantly, their profits increasing because they're moving forward. Sort of like an Apple. If you look at Apple over the last 10 years, they've consistently increased their sales and they consistently increased their profits. That's a company you want to own because you know what that translates into? That translates into increasing the stock price. And that's the whole point of owning a company is not to be for the stock price to go down, but for the stock price to go up. Even though past performance isn't 100% predictor of future performance, it is nevertheless a good sign. The only thing you have to work, worry about is when a growth company gets to maturity phase and then they're going to grow a lot slower and profits are going to slow. It's still growing and profits are still going up and sales are still going up, but their pace of the trend is not as steep. The incline is not as, the slope is not as steep. So that means that slowdown can also push stock prices lower as people aren't expecting as much from the company in the future. And again, this is the income statement where, sort of like your paycheck, if you're working, you have your, 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 your net at the top and your gross at the bottom, and every deduction comes out along the way. So just like in your paycheck, you have your gross amount, and then you have your FICA, your federal, your state. Um, coming out of it, you, you might have Social Security, oh, that's FICA, uh, Medicare, you, you might have uh, retirement, all these, you know, all these different things coming out of your paycheck. And at the very bottom is your net just like your net profits at the bottom of the income statement, and you say to yourself, gee, I made $1,000 last week, but I'm only taking home 600 That doesn't seem right. But that's, that's the way it is. And it's the same thing for companies. Their, their revenues are a good deal, a big, a, certainly a huge amount, but then when you get down to the actual net profits of the company, you could have a $100 million company in sales, but they may only generate $10 million in net profits. That's why I don't always look at the sales of a company because there could be another $100 million company in sales that generates $25 million in profits. Now that's a company I want to own because their profit margins are higher. Another very important statement is the cash flow statement because the sources of cash are very important. Just like I was telling you about that person before that seems like they have a lot of money. So every time they, that you go out with them, they, they buy drinks, they pay for dinner, they're always you know, go, buying things at the store, and you're thinking, wow, this person has a lot of cash. And they do have a lot of cash flow. But where is the cash flow coming from? If it was coming from credit cards and bank loans and cash advancements, then that's not as good as someone who's generating this money from, a, from income from a job and spending it. So you, I think you can agree the sources of cash that you're spending are very important. If you're spending all your money on credit cards and, and loans, that's not as good as if you're spending money that you're earning through your operations of a job. That's a better source of cash. So you can get money from borrowing it from your job or operations or from your investments. Companies have investments. Companies buy other companies. Companies buy bonds. Companies buy, companies buy other stock. Companies buy other real estate and then after certain years they may sell it. So they could have income from investments. So if you're looking at a company, the best source of cash is from operations, then from investments, then from borrowed sources. So, but we still, at the end of the day, we want to know where, these, where the sources of cash are coming from. And then we also want to know where they're using it, where they're spending it. Um, and we want to see that, we want to see a trend that the company is generating more organic cash through their operations and relying less on investments and borrowing money. And this is a typical cash flow statement which we could break down in um, uh, cash from operations, which is the most important and most useful. And we have cash flow from investing activities. You buy a stock or a bond, it pays a dividend, you buy real estate and you sell it, make a profit. And then cash from financing activities, borrowing short and long-term debt. Uh, and then add these three sources together and that's your total cash flow. And then we like to look to see if the cash flow is increasing or decreasing. And cash flow is a more pure form of what the company's doing. So if you're gonna, if I'm gonna advise anybody to buy a business, maybe a small business, a pizza shop, a laundromat, any, a liquor store, you look at the cash flow, not the net profits of the business. How much cash does the operations generate? Because they may have a lot of loans on the operation. They may have a lot of expenses that you may not have. You may pay for the whole operation in cash. So you're not going to have those debt or interest payments. Um, so you're really mostly concerned about what amount of cash does the operations generate. 
that's the most important point of buying any business. And it's more pure than net profit because net profit has, um, can have uh, a bunch of other non-cash deductions out of it to lower the taxability. So the net profit, you don't really want to, it's not going to be as helpful in buying a company, especially a small company. And then another thing to, to add, for some small companies, you, you want to know, you want to ask them, and it's, it's a sad fact that a lot of small companies don't report all the cash they generate. So if you're buying a small business, a lot of times, and I've seen this over and over again, they'll tell you, like, you know, these are my sales and profits, but really this is the amount of money I bring in, but I just take money out of the top to pay my employees off the books, so that's never reported. You know? But if you're smart in selling a business, you stop doing that and incorporate that back into your business so your business seems more valuable legitimately. You know? and I'm not, I'm not um, advising anyone to do that because that is you know, illegal. So. I'm saying people are doing it. I don't condone it or think it's right. Okay. Uh, sources of financial statements, you can get them from the company's annual report. There are companies 10Q, 10K, 10Q, those are additional quarterly reports. The S, the Securities and Exchange Commission, has a website that has their financial statements. Standard & Poor's or Moody will report their financial statements. There are many internet uh, portals, such as Hoover's and Yahoo Finance. Uh, Google Finance, they'll give you financial statements. So they're all over the internet because they have to be published and publicly made for any company that's a public company. Okay, so let's now move into the key financial ratios. And this is one aspect that the textbook doesn't go into so deeply, but I'm going to go into it a little bit more deeply because it's needed for you to complete your investment analysis report. So um, we're going to study the relationship between uh, financial statement accounts. And we want to develop um, this information to get a handle on understanding how the company performs, how they operate, you know, how they conduct their business, and what potential the company has in the future. So the financial statements are very difficult. If you look at a professional, not these textbook financial statements that are one page. I've worked on financial statements at companies that are multiple, multiple pages that, that bleed out the profit centers and cost centers, and they're just a huge huge amount of accounts and things to look at. So it's very difficult to compare financial statements between companies and very difficult to look at the raw financial statements and get an idea of how well the company is doing. Uh, it's sort of like you, what you want is a quick way of doing it. You know, sort of ever have, you know, read a big book like War and Peace, but instead you get the cliff notes, which is like a summarized version of what the story is and the characters and sort of like um, a fast way of understanding it. That's what financial ratios are. They're sort of like the x-rays that could look, look through the financial statements to give you more meaning, meaningful relationships between the num numbers. So we can use these to look at historical trends. Uh, we can look at them in industry points of view between your company and other companies, get a better idea of performance and competitiveness. Now, financial statements are broken up into five groups. So you have your liquidity ratios. They're going to look at the day-to-day -day operations and how liquid they are and meeting their short-term obligations. That would sort of be like looking at you and saying, you know, uh, how much money do you make a month and what is your rent and your credit card bills and your car payment. Just get an idea of how stable you are. And the more excess money you have, you don't want to live paycheck by paycheck, meaning that your whole paycheck is used to cover your expenses. You want to have uh, generate a significant amount of money left over after you pay your expenses that you could save and invest. Activity ratios, looking at how well the company's managing its assets. Are they getting the maximum amount of profits from their asset? Say you own a house and that's your asset. If you own a house and no one lives in it, is that a good utilization of that asset? No. If you live in it, then that's a good utilization because now you're at least don't have to rent an apartment and pay rent somewhere else, you're living in your house and you, you don't have those additional living costs. It's even better if you rent out every room in your house to say a college student and you have a five bedroom house, so you live in the garage or the basement and then you rent out those five bedrooms to five college students who each can pay you $500 a month and plus utilities. Now that's a better utilization of that asset. Now it's even better if you get those college students to agree to rent it for 12 months, not 10 months. So now it's generating income all year long. 
Um, and then it's even better utilization if you find some other people to rent out the living room and the kitchen and the bathroom and have them live in those rooms as well. So now you're really maximizing your, your utilization of that asset. No, I wouldn't say it's the best ideal conditions for everybody, but at least your house is generating. But with the higher utilization of the asset, the more maintenance and the repair we'll need. So you might have to um, do, spend additional money and that takes away from that utilization as well. If it's just like if you had a car and you're running it a great deal, it's gonna run out of its, its lifespan a lot faster than the car you're not utilizing as much. So there's also wear and tear. And this. So the activity ratios are important to see how efficient the business is running. Uh, leverage ratios, looking at debt used by the company in relationship to assets and equity. And that's important to give an to give um, idea of the risk of the company, how much risk there is in the company. Profitability ratios, I feel these are the most important. These measure the profitability of the company from, say, the gross, the beginning, sales and um, costs, to operations after expenses, to net profits after taxes and interest. So, the profitability ratios really measure how successful the company is at creating profits. And that's what, as an investor or as an owner, that's what we care about, maximizing profits, which maximizes the wealth of the investors. And if you own a share of stock, you are an investor. And if you own a stock in a company, you're not rooting for the company to you know, not maximize profits or lose profits. You want them to maximize profits because it's the only thing that's going to maximize share price. Okay. And then the um, common stock ratios looking at uh, certain key financial figures of the company in relationship to financial markets um, per share basis, uh, putting things like revenues and book value and profits and per share amounts to get it more relatable to other public companies. Okay. So let's move into liquidity ratios. So the first one, a common, very common one, let's see if it does, do I do the quick? No. Uh, is the current ratio where we just look at current assets by current liabilities. Here we want the higher the number, the more liquid. So the higher the better here as far as the current ratio that we calculate. And again, we like companies that have more current assets than current liabilities. Just like in your life, it'd be better if you had, you know, you're making $500 a week and you have $5,000 in the savings account and you only owe on your credit card $900. That's a very good current ratio. So you want more current assets compared to li current liabilities. It makes you more financially stable. Better ability to pay your bills. Now, another th this is not so much a ratio as it is a number, but working networking capital uh, is the current assets minus current liabilities. So it just tells us how, how much do we have to work with. Just sort of like if you had to stop and say, okay, here's the money I'm generating for the month and all my expenses, my rent, credit card payments, gasoline, whatever, um, not gasoline, whatever liabilities I have, what money's left over. So you could say, you know, I make $5,000 a month and I have between my uh, liabilities I have $3,000, so that $2,000 is what I have to work with that I can maybe invest in stocks or buy something else, some other assets. So networking capital is important to see how much money the company is working with. Uh, now this is not, um, this is not a, a percentage, it's a full number, so it's not always comparable among different companies. We just want to make sure that the networking capital is positive, not negative. So it's really just a liquidity check. So the higher the amount, obviously, the more working capital, the better, the more flexibility a company has. Okay. And it's important to have a high working capital to take care of, to take, you know, on short-term investments or um, just to give the, some financial security to the company. Uh, accounts receivable turnover, how quickly the company can collect its accounts receivable. And accounts receivable is, is credit to customers. So, in the consumer world, you have to pay the company right away with either cash or a credit card. But in the business to business world, if I'm one business selling jet engines to another company who's going to make the airplane, I'll sell it to them on credit and they will promise to pay me. And there's no interest, it's just I'm, I'm going to give it to you first, you pay me later. 
So that becomes accounts receivable. And the faster you can collect it, the higher the ratio. So if I have uh, my annual sales are 12 billion and my accounts receivable are 1 billion, that means I'm collecting every month or 12 times a year. And that's, that's very efficient. But if I had 12 billion in sales and 6 billion in accounts receivable, that means people are taking six months to pay me. So the higher the better, we want, to be, we want to know the amount of turns. So the smaller the balance you have in accounts receivable, the more people have paid you. And that means the, the more turns you're gonna have in accounts. So the higher the turns, the better. You wouldn't want to have sell $12 billion worth of something in January and have to wait to next January to get paid. That would be a turn of one. So it takes you a full year to collect your money. You've only turned your accounts receivable once for the year. And that's rarely bad. So you want to collect your money as fast as possible. That's why a lot of businesses like to say cash only because you're collecting it instantly. You don't have to wait. If you pay for it on a credit card or check to a small business, they have to wait a number of days before that clears. And it's not as fast, it's not really collecting as fast. Inventory turnover, sales to inventory. Another important look, how efficient are they at their inventories? So companies that keep too big of inventory are inefficient. So <clears throat> ideally, we'd like companies to turn around and sell their inventory as fast as possible. Um, say cereal was your inventory. How many times, um, what's your turnover of your cereal? So if you look at your, say your, we'll consider your consumption of cereal to be your sales. Um, so you, can, you consume 52 boxes of cereal a year, one box a week. So if you only have an inventory of one box, you're gonna have an inventory turn rate of 52. And that's efficient. It's inefficient for you to go ahead in January and buy 52 boxes of cereal to last you the full year, because that would be a turn of one. So your annual cereal is 52 boxes, and your current inventory is 52 boxes. So that would be a turn of one. That's inefficient. Can you imagine all the storage space you'd need to store 52 boxes of cereal? And, and the liability of the potential for some of that to be damaged, stolen, eaten, um, or spoiled? So that's why we want to look at the turns. We want companies to be a lot more efficient and that's why a lot of auto, automobile manufacturers have tried to adopt these just-in-time inventories where they pull in the inventory just hours or maybe days before they need it to keep their actual inventories lower. And it's very beneficial for companies. You come into a company and say they have $20 million worth of inventory. And if you could figure out a way to pare that down to $10 million worth of inventory, you just generated $10 million worth of cash for that company. Because as they utilize the inventory and sell it, that's just all cash that you don't have to reinvest in expanding their inventory again. Just like if you bought those 52 boxes of cereal, instead of replacing them as you use them, you just say, I'm gonna keep using them. Or maybe a better example is, you look at your kitchen and you, you have a lot of food in your kitchen, but every week you go shopping. If you just suddenly said, you know what? For the next month, I'm not gonna go shopping. I'm just gonna eat whatever food's in the kitchen. And if you had enough of the inventory and it could last you a whole month, you just save four weeks of grocery shopping and that's more cash. So we like it when inventory turnovers are increasing because it means the company is going to generate more cash by utilizing the inventory more efficiently. But again, it's very industry specific. Some industries, you can't really look, compare this, this turnover rate between different industries because each industry has their own specific dynamics of the inventory they must hold and how quickly they can turn it. Okay, total asset turnover is looking at sales to assets. So we, we want a higher ratio here. We want the assets to generate more and more sales. So, uh, or we want to find an asset that's less expensive to help generate the same amount of sales. So to give you a good example, think of an ice cream shop. So I could be Red Mango and buy four or five big expensive $100,000 soft serve machines. So that's a lot of assets. You go into Red Mango, which is basically, I think, an ice cream store, even though they say frozen yogurt, whatever. You go into Red Mango, they have a lot of assets to generate that soft serve ice cream for you. And so whatever sales, say they generate a million dollars worth of sales, and they have $500,000 worth of assets in the store. So the turnover is only two. But then you go to Professor Nugent's ice cream store, who knows about uh, assets, and I say, I don't want any expensive assets, just give me a couple of used refrigerators 
and some ice, and we'll put some buckets of ice cream in there and some scoops, and we'll just scoop them out like a Ben and Jerry's or Baskin and Robbins. That's a very low level of assets I need, maybe only $10,000 of assets and inventory I need um, to make, and I could, I can easily probably make the same amount of sales because you know at the end of the day, ice cream in your cup is ice cream in your cup, and some people prefer. Uh, harder ice cream rather than softer ice cream. There's, there's ice cream, everybody wants ice cream, so there's enough sales for all these stores. So if I make, you know, a million dollars of sales on, say, $10,000 worth of assets, my turns are much higher. And since I have such a small amount of assets, I didn't have to borrow a lot of money, I don't have a lot at risk, my, you know, uh, all my ratios are going to look better. So if you, so you had a choice between buying, say, um, a Ben & Jerry's or a Red Mango, uh, and Ben and Jerry's might be better because of the lower cost of assets compared to the Red Mango. In fact, a lot of Red Mangos have been closing because their um, asset utilization is poor. Because they, um, while because they're not a business that year round is that busy, busier in the summer than the winter, and they have a lot of assets they have to support. Meanwhile, you have a low asset business like Ralph's Ices that are smart enough to close in the winter are only open and open extended in the summer and only really have ices and refrigerators so they have low asset and they typically are doing much better than the red mango locations so this is how as a financial analyst how I look at these stores so I saw a red mango two red mangoes one in center reach one in farming uh, Dale both of them have already closed they weren't even operating for six months they just were crushed underneath the weight and the expense of their assets and expenses but I see these Ralph's Ices open all the places, a lot of places, and they're open year-round, even though they close a few months in the winter and have no revenue, because they're much more efficient in their expenses and their ices, and their assets, not ices. Their ices are good, not asses, ices. I know I'm, I'm slurring. It's too much coffee already, I think. Okay, leverage ratios. We're moving into leverage ratios now. Debt to equity ratio. We want to know long-term debt compared to shareholders' equity. Um, the higher this ratio, the more risk, meaning the more debt. So this is one of the, the ratios where we like to have a, low, a lower number. Because most ratios you'll find that the larger the number, the better in, in analyzing the company. Here's the one exception where we want a smaller number. So we want more equity, less debt to make a company be more, uh, less risky, I should say. Uh, and, um, because long-term debt is risky. It has to be paid off and there's interest associated with it. So companies that are managing or lowering their long-term debt are thereby increasing their equity. Okay. And we can look at times interest earned. And this is, this is looking at earnings before interest and taxes divided by interest expense. So in, in a personal point of view, say the amount of money you earn in relationship to the interest on your credit card debt. So if you make $1,000 a month and your interest is $100 a month on your credit card debt, you really don't have a financial problem there. But if you only make $1,000 a month and your interest is $1,000, that's a problem. So, if you're, you're, so the higher this ratio, the better. So you want a high times interest earned ratio, meaning that you have earning much more operational money than the interest you're paying on, on your debts. So you have a better ability to pay the interest expense on what you've borrowed. That's why when you buy a house, they look at your revenue, your income, relation, in relationship to the cost of the, the monthly mortgage on the house, because they want to make sure that you make enough to be able to pay that monthly bill and you're successful in, in continuing to pay for the mortgage on the house. And this is sort of what this times interest earned is looked at at companies. You want to make sure the companies make enough that they can pay their interest expense on the money that they borrowed because it makes them less risky. So we want a higher ratio here and less risky. Okay. Uh, in the profitability ratios, in the net profit margin, of course, all the profitability ratios, the higher the better. So the net profit margin is really the bottom line. And after, you know, you look at the sales, you subtract all your expenses and taxes, and you get your net profits after tax divided by total revenues and gives you your net profit margin. So this is you know, accounting-wise, the bottom line. So if, for every dollar you sell, if your net profit margin is 10%, every dollar you sell, you're pocketing 10 cents after you pay for everything in the business. So clearly, the companies with the higher net profit margins are the stronger companies 
when you look at an industry level. Um, I don't have it up here, but operational profit margins, you'd look at uh, operational income divided by total revenues. And that's going to be higher than net profits, because net profits have additional tax and interest taken out of them. And then the gross profit margin, we're going to look at um, uh, gross profit divided by total revenues. And gross profit is basically revenues minus costs, the direct costs, the materials and labor to make the product. So your gross profit margins are the highest, then you have your operational profit margins, uh, and then the net profit margins. So operational is more indirect expenses. Advertising, indirect employees like in finance, accounting, and marketing, um, amortization, depreciation, things that give you operational. And then the net income, you take your operational profits, take away taxes and interest, and you get your net income. So it's just like that income statement, different levels. And of course, in all these different metrics, the higher, the better. So if you look at a company like McDonald's, they have a very high, maybe the, uh, one of the highest gross profit margins in the industry, but their net profit margin isn't that much higher in relationship because they spend a huge amount of money in advertising out of the operations. So a lot of times you want to question, if the gross profit margin is 50%, how come the operational profit margin is 20%? What happened to those 30 percentage points? Where are they spending that? And, if, and is there a way that it can minimize those expenses? To make the company more profitable. Okay. If we look at return on assets, here we're looking at um, the net profit margin after taxes divided by total assets. So whatever assets we, we purchase, we want to see what return we're getting for them. Just like if you bought that house as your asset and you rented out all those rooms, you want to see um, what your net profit is after your expenses of the house, how much money you have left over after you pay for cable, water, heat, maintenance, in relationship to the, the value of the house. And that gives you a percentage of return on an asset. So for companies, if they're buying all those soft serve ice cream machines and that's $500,000 and they make um, $100,000 in net profits, that's a 20% return on assets. So we want to make sure that companies are getting returns on their assets and not losing money on the assets. Because that could be possible that you know, they're, not, they're not getting much of a return from the assets they purchased. They purchase, you, know, you don't want to buy a Porsche to deliver pizzas in if you're a pizza company. If you're Domino's, not that they buy their own cars, but if you were Domino's, you're not going to buy Porsches to deliver pizzas, but maybe you'll buy a Prius to deliver pizzas in. Because that, that car as an asset is going to generate more uh, profits than driving around a Porsche or a Lexus based on the expenses and the cost of those uh, cars. And, and the higher, you know, sometimes having a big, big amount of assets, but they're only generating a small amount of income, that's going to show a low return on those assets. So you always want to have the most efficient asset possible to get the highest return. So if you need, say you need a car to drive to work, the return asset would say, buy the most um, affordable car with the smallest amount of expenses to get to work. That will generate you the most return. So you don't want to buy a, a, an $800, you don't want to buy a car that's going to require an $800 lease to drive to work when a car with a $200 lease will do the same. No. All right. Okay, so I'm going to... Uh, stop here for today, for today. It's been an hour, and I'm going to finish this uh, next time where we're going to talk a little bit more in depth on analyzing a company's profitability and how these financial ratios relate to each other and the different ways of looking at them to give us a better idea of how, um, how well the company is performing and what type of valuation you can put on them. Okay.